Welcome to Poems for Bugs, a seminar uh, where we will look at C64 coding from a rather unusual point of view. My name is Linus, although to most of you I'm probably more known as LFT. And I would like to start with just some brief words about my own background, especially as far as computers are concerned, because I think it throws a light on why I see uh, these things the way I do. Because you see, I wasn't brought up on the C64. I was born in 81, the year before the C64 was launched. So our first computer at home was an Amiga 1000. And then when I was old enough to, uh, and have saved enough money to buy my own computer, it was an Amiga 1200. So those are the computers that I have all these fond memories of. Then at some point, I was at the age where everybody was running around with scientific calculators. Uh, usually that would be the TI-83. And those could be programmed in machine code. Uh, so I, I, I had already done some programming and I dived into this and wanted to learn to do that. And one of the fascinating things about writing code for the calculator was that everybody at school had exactly the same hardware. So I could f discover tricks or jump directly into ROM routines and so on, and it would work on everybody's calculator. And that was cool. Uh, then, of course, TI blew it because they released the TI-83+, which wasn't compatible. But anyway, uh, then uh, we're reaching about 99 or something. And by that time, Linux was mature enough that I decided to buy a PC. I had been running Linux for a while on my Amiga 1200 by that time. Uh, and uh, of course, I had, I had attempted to do some productions, some demo scene productions on the Amiga. On the PC, I also played around with four kilobyte intros and so on, made a few ones. Then in uh, 2008, I had stumbled into electronics and microcontrollers, and that's when I released my first microcontroller demo, Craft. And that taught me the joy of cycle-accurate coding. And if you don't know what cycle-accurate coding is, now you will have a pretty good idea after this seminar. Uh, and then it wasn't until last year that I started seriously looking into the C64. And that means that, first of all, I have a little less of that cloudy nostalgia filter uh, that some people have about the C64. And so I'm able to focus on the, the things that would convince somebody to start coding C64 today. And um, you also sort of see uh, the various components of C64 programming inevitably leading to me looking into the real machine uh, last year. So you have the cycle accurate coding on the microcontroller, you have the shared hardware platform of the TI-83, and you have Commodore business machines, of course. But enough about me. Let's talk about you, the audience. This was announced as a talk for coders and non-coders alike, so I'm quite curious to learn who turned up. So let's do a quick show of hands. How many of you are coders? That's very many, <laughs> okay. Any non-coders in here? Okay, uh, 5%, 5 to 10%, that's cool, cool. Um, of the coders, how many of you have written in a low-level language? And by that I mean machine code or assembly language. Okay, we're down to about 60% or something. Uh, how many of you ever had to count clock cycles? Okay, now we're down to less than 30% perhaps. Okay, how many of you are C64 coders? Yeah, a bit fewer. Okay, cool. This is a great audience because it has this spread that I had hoped for. And what will happen is that at some points there will be a bit too much detail for some of you, and at some points really too, too little detail for some of you. Uh, but if this gets very complicated and you sort of lose track, then please don't lose hope because the presentation is made in such a way that even if you don't get all the details, you can still see the big picture. So where do we begin? This chart was released a couple of years ago by Marco Reunanen. I believe some of you have seen it already. Uh, it shows the number of demos released per platform per year. So you have the years from 1984 all the way up to 2010. And then you have the number of demos released, peaking at 2,200 or something. And you have the various platforms. So the first one is C64, and then Amiga with the original chipset. And then you have a few others, MS-DOS, uh, Windows, and there are a couple of things you can see in this chart, but I'm going to draw your attention to just one of them, and that is that this, the, all the platforms have a peak and a decline, and usually the declines go to a very low level, but the C64 one stays at something around 20 to 30% of the annual demoscene output, 
uh, and it's been there for about 15 years and still counting. Um, so there has to be something special about the C64, right? Uh, another way of putting it is that the C64 has survived the platforms that came after it. So the Amiga came here and was at some point vastly more popular than the C64, but then at another time they switched places again, and the same with MS-DOS, and it remains to be seen where the C64 also survives Windows. <laughs> no, seriously, we don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 years, right? Um, so, you can ask people then, this is now a room full of C64 coders, you can ask people, why do you still make C64 demos today? And you get all sorts of answers. And some of them are technical, and some of them are personal, and some of them are uh, rational, some are not so rational. Uh, and I'm going to focus in this talk on the technical reasons and on the reasons that I think would convince someone to start C64 coding today. But you should keep it the back of your, at the back of your head that there are all sorts of reasons apart from the ones that I'm going to discuss. But let's start with this one. Powerful computers pose no challenge. That is, uh, you can compare it to, um, for instance, bicycle racing. Uh, people do that still today, even though the automobile has been invented, right? And uh, archery, people spend a lot of hours learning to be very good at shooting with bow and arrow, even though the gun has been invented. So you sort of see this pattern that there is um, a taste in challenges, because certainly a car, shooting a gun and making a PC demo involves challenges. But from the point of view of somebody who grew up with one kind of challenge, those other challenges are not that fun and you sort of have a view that there are no other challenges than the one that I like. A more diplomatic way of saying it is that you can have a taste in challenges, right? And speaking of automobiles, uh, there are people who drive uh, antique cars, and some of those people are, of course, antique themselves, but most of them aren't, and it's, uh, it's usually some kind of fascination or admiration of the machine itself. Uh, one of the things is that if you open the hood, you can see all the pieces and how they fit together and how it works. And on a modern car, it's just too complex to do that. And so you can admire the beauty of the engineering, and this is the same with old computers. And the reason is that in order to see the beauty of an engineering solution, you have to understand it. And if it's simple, then you may understand it immediately. If it's complex, you would have to work to understand it, so you don't do that. So you see the simplicity of these old machines much quicker. A completely different reason, and modern platforms are moving targets. Remember about five years ago, everybody started doing ray marching in, uh, in the PC scene. Uh, that was partly because the hardware was now up to it. So because of developments in graphics cards, it was suddenly possible to make ray marching in real time, and so people did that. Also, somebody obviously had to innovate and, and realize that we can take this old offline technique and apply it in real time. But, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly not picking on the people doing this. I have the greatest respect for people who make this and, and to squeeze it into four kilobytes. But, and, and that takes a lot of skill and ingenuity, but that skill and ingenuity in itself is not responsible for the wave of ray marching intros that came in 2009. It's the hardware that had evolved as well. Whereas on the C64, if there is a new effect, uh, trend, if you, if you like, uh, and that everybody starts doing, and that hasn't been done before, then it's truly just an innovation because it could have been done 30 years ago, but nobody knew about it until somebody figured it out. So that's the difference. And, and also because this static uh, hardware, uh, you can make world records. So you can, you can say that, oh, my routine has more sprites or more uh, uh, scrollers on the screen at the same time that, than anybody has ever managed to do before, for instance. And, 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 and a third thing about this static hardware is that things will never break. There are a couple of different versions of the chips in the C64. So you have two different SID chips, two different VIC chips, and two different versions of the peripheral chips. But that is all you have to support. There will never be new revisions of these chips. So you're quite safe, and you can do all the trickery you want, unlike with the TI-83. And then we get to what I think is, well, it's, it's my favorite reason. Uh, it's about the limitations of the C64. Now, if you say this in a casual conversation, and the other party is polite, they will ask you, what are those limitations? And so 
in the interests of brevity, you will start some, something like this. You will say, well, first of all, it's a one megahertz machine. So that makes it 2,000 times slower than a PC. Okay, that sounds like a really limiting situation, right? Uh, what else? Uh, the, the RAM, the memory, is 64 kilobytes. That's like 100,000 times as small as a PC. So that sounds really limiting. And then, uh, in order not to bore the other person, you probably stop there. But the problem is that now the other person has a view of the limitations of the C64. That isn't quite accurate. It, uh, the person will think that if a PC is a regular modern building like this, then the C64 is just a much smaller building that doesn't have windows. <laughs> but a much more apt comparison, if we stick with the building metaphor, is that the C64 is like some kind of old crazy mansion with secret doorways and trap doors and passages and no right angles and unexplicable corridors that don't lead anywhere. And it may not be efficient or practical, but it surely has charm and personality. And so the limitations are more like quirks. And I would like to invite you on a tour of this building and show you some of the quirks of the C64. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about bugs. This is a digger wasp carrying a grasshopper. The grasshopper is stunned. It's become food. Uh, the digger wasp is called uh, the digger wasp because it digs a hole in the ground. Then it brings food into the hole in the form of stunned grasshoppers. And then it lays its eggs there so that when the eggs hatch, there will be food for them. It's interesting to study the digger wasp because of how it puts the grasshopper in the hole. First, it brings the grasshopper to the entrance, leaves it there, goes down alone into the hole, goes back up, and pulls the grasshopper down. So it goes through this little ritual, this little sequence of steps for all the grasshoppers. Now, humans also do sequences, and, and we have our little rituals. Uh, for instance, that morning cup of coffee that you make without thinking. But we can also be aware of the sequences that we are performing. We can react if something is wrong and, and we have to improvise. But insects don't do that. The sequences or rituals are hardwired into the insects. And so it, it may not come as a surprise that there is a little glitch in the system. So we start from the beginning again. The wasp brings the grasshopper uh, and puts it down at the entrance, goes into the hole. At this point, we move the grasshopper just a little bit, and the wasp comes up, finds that something is wrong, and is confused and thinks that it is back at the first step. So it goes into the hole to check just that everything is all right. Now we move the grasshopper again just a little bit. Digger wasp goes up, goes down. We move the, and yeah, you get the point. You can do this any number of times you like. The, the wasp will never figure out that it's being tricked. It, it just does this automatically. Now, what is the point of making a wasp go in a loop? It doesn't seem very useful. Right? There are other ways in which we can trick animals uh, into behaving in, and, and performing services for us, like with these pigeons. But making a wasp go in a loop doesn't seem that useful. But it does teach us a lot about nature and a lot about engineering. Because apparently the wasp does not have an internal representation of the ritual itself, uh, of the sequence itself. It seems instead that the wasp has a set of rules, like the gray boxes here, very simple rules, uh, in independent rules. And some of the rules are conditioned. So, so these are then conditions on the left edge and along the top. And the rule only applies if all the conditions to the left and all the conditions above it are fulfilled. Uh, so the way this works is that the wasp can observe whether she is outside the hole or in the hole. Uh, she can see if there is any food. There is also one bit of memory here. And one bit of memory in programming jargon is called a flag because American uh, mailboxes have a little red flag on them. They can be up or down. Uh, so here's one bit of memory to keep track on whether uh, the wasp has checked that everything is all right in the hole. And supposing we start here. We're outside. There's no food. And so, we, so this rule applies. Find food and bring it to the entrance. 
All right, so we do that, and we keep doing that. The, all the thing, all, everything the WASP has to do is just perform the rule that is activated. At some, point, at some point, the WASP will have succeeded in bringing food to the entrance. Now the condition no food near entrance is no longer true. So this rule doesn't apply anymore, but food near entrance is true. So, so we do that, we go into the hole, right? Now we end up here. We're not outside, we're in the hole. And so we set the checked flag, right? Then we're over there. Drop any carried item and leave the hole. Okay, we're not carrying anything, but we can leave the hole. And now we're outside. And usually that will then be food at expected spot. And so what we do is we bring the food into the hole. Now we're back on this one again. We we'll drop the grasshopper, leave the hole. And now we just have to clear the checked flag because now obviously there's no food anymore. And that brings us back to the first one. So there are a couple of things, a couple of subtleties here. One is that this is a very efficient representation. There's only one bit of memory. It's sort of stored in the outside world, uh, in the environment of the WASP. The second is that uh, the rules themselves are rather compact. Remember, it's a seven-step sequence, but there are only six rules. So that shows that nature has evolved into a, a very efficient representation of the sequence. Um, when we do the glitch, we uh, uh, start the same way, and then uh, when the wasp goes up the first time, uh, she will end up at clear the checked flag again, and then she will move over, over here. and stay in a, in a loop in the middle there. Um, and that is how you exploit a bug. And now we turn to some of the exploitable bugs of the C64 home computer. First of all, what is a home computer? That is a marketing term, so it's not very precise. It's a bit like people in 20 years are going to look back and scratch their heads and wonder what a smartphone is, right? But a home computer is a computer targeted for home use, of course. Um, and to sell computers to the homes, you have to make them cheap. You have to make them affordable. And one of the ways of doing that is to make sure that people don't need to buy a monitor. Uh, back in those days, people would actually watch television, so it was a, a fair bet that people had a television set at home. So what they did was they made all these computers that would hook up to the television. And that means you have to produce a television signal. So. This is the inside of Commodore 64. It's the entire computer. Um, so in all the home computers, there will be some kind of circuitry to generate a TV signal. And in the C64, it's this chip called the Video Interface Controller. And it, uh, the TV signal is very timing critical. Uh, so the VIC chip is also responsible for generating various clocks to drive the other chips uh, in the computer. Everything is synchronized to the television signal. Now, you have to keep in mind that television is very old. Uh, it's, it goes back way before the digital revolution. It's a very primitive signal. Uh, all it is is that the receiver has a, an electron beam that sweeps all over the, the screen one line at a time. So it visits all the points in, on the screen. And the transmitter just has to say what the current color is. And the picture will emerge from that. Uh, there's also a sync signal so, you, so that they all, the transmitter and receiver know that they start at the top left corner at the same time, right? But, but basically, the, the beam sweeps at a constant speed. Unlike a PC monitor, we have different display modes and refresh rates and resolutions. Uh, TV just has one. And uh, so all you have to do to create a TV signal is to be very good at keeping time and just produce the pixels in this order. Right. If you power on a C64, this is what you see. If you haven't been conditioned to ignore it, one thing will, will pop out, and that is that there's a huge border around here where you can't put any graphics. And why is that? I mean, it seems like a waste, um, but it has a very good reason. In uh, television production and movie production, you talk about safe areas. So you have the action safe area and the title safe area. And that is because there was no standardization of how much of the image is visible on a television set. So, and, and if you go back here, you can see that, look at those rounded corners, for instance. You don't want to have computer software that puts some, inform, some important information in a corner case, and it gets hidden behind that plastic bend there, right? So 
in order to avoid people returning their computers because they didn't work, Commodore played it safe and put everything in the title safe area. Um, yes, so the VIC chip visits all the pixels in order. When it uh, has finished with one raster line, the, it's called a raster because it's another word for grid. So all the pixels are in a large grid. Uh, so one raster line, and then the VIC chip has to wait for a little bit in, before it starts on the next line with the first pixel. And so this little delay is called the horizontal blanking interval. Uh, and then after the final pixel, in, in the bottom right corner, there's an even longer delay called the vertical blanking interval before everything starts again uh, on the next video frame. So to visualize this time, uh, because pixels uh, have a static amount of time that they occupy in the signal, we can also visualize this extra waiting time using pixels. And if you start the, the VICE C64 emulator and select border mode debug, this is what you see. You see all these extra pixels that aren't really pixels. They're just there to, to visualize the time. Um, now, I keep saying that uh, the television uh, signal is very timing critical. And in order to, order to keep time, you need two things. You need a clock and a timetable. And we will soon return to the timetable of the VIC chip. Uh, let's start first with a clock. Uh, a regular clock has seconds, right? And then you group 60 seconds together into a minute and 60 minutes into an hour and so on. On the C64, the smallest unit of time is the dot. And this is the time that it takes to produce one pixel. There are about 8 million dots per second. Um, then you group 8 dots into uh, a cycle. And why do you do that? Uh, if you want to make cheap electronics, you should avoid high speed. Uh, high-speed parts. So what the Commodore engineers did was that they made uh, only one part of the VIC chip work at this high speed of the individual uh, pixels or dots. And then the rest of the VIC chip, and indeed the rest of the computer, is working uh, at the cycle level instead. So you can only do one thing every eight pixels. And uh, the reason they chose eight is because this is an eight-bit computer, so it's often convenient to work with eight pixels at a time. Then the next unit of time is that 63 cycles make up one raster line, and uh, 312 raster lines make up one video frame. And then after that, time restarts. So in, from the point of view of the VIC chip, everything that happens goes in cycles, and after one video frame, time itself starts over from the beginning. Uh, of all the numbers I've been throwing at you, the, this is the important one, 63. 63 cycles per raster line, because that is a number that appears all over the place in, in C64 effects, and you'll soon see why. Now, the C64 display um, is a layered display. There are different layers. On the top is the border. Uh, the border has a, has a hole in it, of course, uh, where you can see the other layers. Behind the border are eight sprites. Sprite is a small piece of graphic that you can put anywhere on the screen. Uh, it can be partially behind the border and so on. Uh, and they can move independently. And, and then behind the sprites uh, are, is the text area, which is 40 by 25 characters. And then behind the text area, there's something called the idle graphics, which you normally don't see. So you have this layered model with all, all the sprites and so on. And for a PC coder, for instance, this would seem rather complicated. On a PC, you just have one large grid in memory. One memory cell maps to one pixel and just store the color value. Uh, that seems a lot simpler. Why didn't they do this uh, at, in the early 80s? And the reason, there are two reasons. One is that memory was really expensive. So they couldn't have a large buffer with one memory cell for every pixel. The second is that even if they could have that amount of memory, the, the computer would be too slow to update it. So you couldn't animate anything. Right? Because that you couldn't update all those pixels before it was time to display another video frame and so on. And so, so that is the reason why you need hardware acceleration in the form of sprites that you can move around. That would be, think of the Pac-Man and the four ghosts as sprites, for instance, and the background as, as text. Um, right. So uh, as I keep saying, uh, Vic visits the pixels one row at a time. And it has to figure out what the color is of that pixel and transmit it to the television set. How does it do that? It, um, 
Well, to keep things simple, uh, let's just consider the border. Uh, so Vic has a flag, uh, one bit of memory, to keep track of whether it is in the border or in the visible area. So uh, here the border is on. Then here, somewhere around cycle 16 or 17, because we can use them as coordinates, of course, uh, uh, around cycle 16 or 17 on every raster line, uh, border is switched off. So the flag is changed. Uh, and then over there at cycle 56, 57, uh, the border is switched on again. Now the reason there are the, um, that I say 16, 17 or thereabout is that you can actually configure so you can switch between a wide or a narrow border. And uh, actually the C64 display is rather rigid. You always have this 40 by 25 grid. You always have eight sprites and you always have the border, at least the way it was designed to, be, to work. And um, a lot of C64 demo coding is about trying to escape from this fixed uh, display mode setup, sort of. And you can do that, you can escape from it either by tricking the hardware or by tricking the viewer. Uh, so there's a lot of illusions and faking things and more or less conjuring tricks uh, to make it seem as, as if there is not this grid and only eight sprites and so on. Uh, but some of it is also about tricking the hardware. So I'm going to teach you a trick, and the trick is how to open the side border. So, so we'll, we'll just ignore the bottom and the top border for now and just think of it, this area here. And we want to prevent the VIC chip from, from turning on the border at the right end of, of the screen so that it remains off all the time. Now, yeah. So the way the VIC chip uh, works is that it has a flag, whether the border is on or off. Uh, it looks at its environment in the sense that it checks if, if the wide or narrow mode is, is selected. And then on these various locations, first half of cycle 17, if we're in the wide uh, border mode and the flag is on, then we clear the flag and so on, just like the WASP. And just like with the WASP, if I the environment at precisely the right moment, then we can trick the, um, the VIC chip so that these independent rules uh, work together in a different way than was intended. So assuming we start with border flag off in the wide mode, uh, VIC chip uh, goes through all the cycles and somewhere exactly between the first half of cycle 56 and the first half of cycle 57, we switch from wide to narrow. Then we dodge both of those rules that, uh, that set the border flag. And so Vic doesn't turn on the border. Then, of course, so, uh, we would end up here uh, for, the next, for the next raster line. And so we would have to switch back to the wide mode again in order to do this trick on every line. But what does it mean to switch border mode at precisely the right moment. It was pretty easy to imagine what it was like to move a grasshopper. But switching border mode, uh, that's maybe a bit abstract still. So uh, of course, this is where the processor enters the picture, the CPU central processing unit. Uh, and this is a chip that executes instructions, very simple instructions. You put them together and call it a program, uh, which is just a long list of instructions. So, uh, and it looks something like this. And that is assembly language, two instructions. Now, there are about 200 instructions to choose from, uh, but I'm going to teach you four of them, and there, it will still be uh, useful with only these ones. The first instruction is called NOP, and that means no operation. Uh, it, it means that the CPU shouldn't do anything, but it's going to take two cycles. And then you have NOP3, which is one of the un undocumented opcodes, so it doesn't have a proper name, but I'm calling it NOP3. Uh, which means that you shouldn't do anything for three cycles. And then uh, moving on to the more uh, useful instructions, perhaps, uh, is uh, LDA immediate, which stands for load accumulator immediate. Uh, that instruction takes a number and puts it in a special holding place called the accumulator. And then uh, store accumulator, STA, is used to take whatever is in the accumulator and store it into memory at some memory location. Um, 
And so the example code over there takes the number 8, stores it in the accumulator, and then it takes whatever is in the accumulator, which is 8, and stores at that memory address, DO16. Now memory is just a set of numbered boxes, and every box can contain one number. Um, of course, these are hexadecimal numbers. Uh, so hexadecimal is just like decimal if you have 16 fingers. Uh, but it's just a number, and it indicates the box where you're going to put the number 8. Okay, uh, some of the boxes, some of the memory locations are special and they are called hardware registers. And when you put numbers in those locations, something happens in the computer. Otherwise, memory is just a way of putting a number there and, saying, and then you can retrieve the number later. But uh, the hardware registers do stuff. And DO16 is a hardware register which controls whether you have the wide or narrow border. So if you store 8 to it, you get the wide border. <clears throat> if you store 0 into it, you get the narrow border. And so uh, if we can somehow ascertain that our code starts running at cycle one on a raster line, which we can do, then uh, if we start here by uh, selecting the wide border, we load number eight and store it into DO16. I should mention also that in the store instruction, the actual writing to the register occurs in the final cycle of the, of the instruction. It's called a write cycle. Uh, that is why it's yellow. Um, and it also happens to be so that it happens in the second half of that cycle, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so we do that at the beginning of the raster line. Then we fill out with knobs until we get close to the critical spot between the first half of cycle 56 and the first half of cycle 57, right? And here we take the number zero and store it to the register. And we make sure that the timing of the instructions is, is so that it's exactly on the second half of cycle 56. And then I just filled up with some not instructions to make it fit on one raster line. And if we do this, we will open the side border once. Assuming our code starts running here at, at cycle one, so it would be over here somewhere. And here we select the, the wide mode and then at, uh, at cycle 56 we do the little glit glitch thing, we switch to the narrow uh, border. Uh, the border doesn't uh, turn on, and it remains off until we get to the next line. But of course, you would want to open the side border for all the lines, at least for all the, the lines to here, right? And there are 200 raster lines in that area. And uh, so you would think, well, then I copy-paste this code 200 times, right? And I get something like this. Unfortunately, uh, well, let me just simplify things and say that this works. There's uh, a quirk that makes this not work, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But for now, let's just assume that this works and that you can turn off the side border all the way by doing this trick uh, 200 times. Now, you just used up 200 out of the 312 raster lines just to open the side border. And that means that you have very little time left to do the actual demo effect. You would have to do it here and here, right, in the vertical blanking area. And that doesn't sound very, very good, right? If you want to compete in a, in a demo compo and, uh, and you just made a, a very slow machine three times slower, right? But here you're just executing NOP instructions. So you could be executing anything you like there. You could be putting uh, computing pixels or doing whatever your demo effect is supposed to be doing in that area. But then you would have to make sure that the timing is correct and that you end up precisely on the right cycle there where you're supposed to open the side border. And so that is what you do uh, in a C64 demo. So whenever you see stuff in the side border, uh, that would be sprites, by the way. So, so normally the border covers the sprites, but if you open the border, you see the sprites that would have been behind it. Uh, whenever you see things in the side border in C64 demo, you know that they are doing this. They are, they are opening it on every single line, and they are fitting the rest of the code inside this very timing-constrained place. Now, of course, uh, here you're putting something in the, in the accumulator, so you can't preserve, you, you can't do something here and then put something in the accumulator and then try to use it on the next raster line, for instance, because the value would have been overwritten by, by this side border opening code. 
Right, I realize this cannot be read at the far back. I can hardly read it from here. But this is the entire behavior of the, of the VIC chip as, as one of these charts. You can find this on my website after the seminar. Uh, it, it's to show you uh, how much things uh, are going on at various times, various cycles. And if you want to combine different VIC tricks into a C64 effect, then there are things you have to do all over the place, all over a raster line. Um, and you can do a lot. You can uh, increase the distance between text lines. You can stretch sprites, which means uh, some of the sprite graphics on several raster lines. You can um, switch banks, uh, memory banks at uh, strategic locations. You can, um, ah, there are lots of things. Um, and you want to combine them in order to, to do new effects. And just like with the Digger Wasp, uh, I forgot to tell you that, but you don't discover the glitch by studying the chart. Of course, you are drawing the chart because you found the glitch. So, uh, and in the same way, you don't discover new Vic tricks by studying a chart like this. Uh, you have to, if you want to find new tricks, you have to study the chip itself. And then you can incorporate that knowledge into a chart like this. Uh, what it also shows, it's, it might be a bit overwhelming right now, but if you print this, it fits on a single piece of paper. So it's not that much of information to internalize. And all C64 coders know mo most of this by heart, even though maybe they don't know it in this visual form, but they have internalized all of this knowledge. <clears throat> now to keep track of all of these places where you have to do stuff, a technique that I use uh, is something I call raster paper. It's just a uh, checkered paper with 63 columns some uh, helping uh, remarks at the top to, to uh, keep track of which cycles apply to which effects. And then I just draw my instructions with pencil. And that way I can sort of, I need an eraser as well, of course. Uh, move things around and, and try to figure out, uh, first placing all the important instructions that have to execute at some point in time, and then trying to fill up the rest of the slots uh, with other instructions. You can find this on my site as well, of course. Um, but this is, uh, um, if you're a coder, you will, you will uh, have realized by now that this is quite unlike ordinary programming. Uh, however, it is very similar to something else that people have been doing for many years uh, because we have always been interested in, in playing with words. Um, and words can be formed into sentences. And... Uh, Sentences can be used to communicate stories, facts, emotions, and so on. And uh, as if you ask any writer, they can tell you that it's, it's quite a challenge to do that, uh, to get it right, to, get, to communicate a story, for instance, in a good way. Uh, but if, you're not, if you don't think that challenge is enough, you can add some more constraints to it. And people did that. Um, so this is the Petrarchan sonnet form. It has 14 lines. Every line has 10 syllables and an optional 11th syllable at the end. And the small dots represent weak syllables and the large circles represent uh, stressed syllables. And so to express something using a sonnet, you would have to take words and place them in this uh, pattern so that all the, the stressed syllables end up on the strong dots and, and, and all the dots are covered. <clears throat> And this is an example of a sonnet uh, that follows this form. I'm not going to read it to you because it's a nice sonnet and rushing through it wouldn't really do it justice. This is old language and you have to look things up. But it's a good one. I suggest you read it. Uh, but the task of the poet then is to take words from the language or a dictionary if you want uh, and place them on the poetic form so that all the dots are covered. And like I said, all the stressed syllables are, are in place. The rhyming pattern also has to, to make sense. So uh, in the sonnet, there are a couple of uh, places where uh, four lines have to rhyme. So you have to find four words that rhyme with each other. Um, so that's quite a, uh, quite a tricky challenge. And people do this because it's fun, of course, uh, and challenging. Now. Let us try to think then of a poetic form for opening the side border. Clearly, we would have to have 63 syllables or cycles on every line. And 
on the cycle 56, you see there I made the dot a little bit smaller because that one has to be a write cycle. And specifically, it has to write into the DO60. And it has to write uh, zero there. And somewhere else on the line, you also have to, to switch back to the, to the wide border mode. But now we get to the point where I lied before because I said that you could just copy paste something 200 times. Well, one of the most famous quirks in the C64 is something called bad lines. And it means that on every eighth raster line, the beginning of text lines, the video chip is stealing 40 cycles from the CPU, which means that you, you're happily executing your code on the top line there. Uh, before stealing the cycles, there is a grace period where you can execute up to three write cycles, which I have marked there as optional syllables. But then you're, you're, the, the CPU is just stalled, and it resumes 40 cycles later. And so, uh, but this is only on every eighth line. Uh, <clears throat> so now we can start uh, filling in this with, with instructions. So there along cycle 56, you see all the writes uh, where we do this glitch thing. And then I decided to put uh, the other instructions where we select the white border all over to the left. And on the bad line, you see that the store instruction, this ST instruction, gets split. So part of it executes here, and then the remaining two cycles uh, occur there. And uh, by the way, we are lucky that the side border trick has to be performed on cycle 56. Because if it had to be performed, for instance, on cycle 55, it wouldn't be possible to do it on a bad line, because then the right cycle would end up on one of the optional cycles there. But we are lucky in this respect. Uh, <clears throat> and then I left, uh, when switching to the wide mode, I, I just moved that a bit earlier so that the LDA occurs at the end of the previous uh, text row. Because otherwise there would be a gap of one cycle, and there are no one cycle instructions. Right, um, and so, so this is the poetic form for opening the side border, and we can fill it in with whatever um, code we want that, unlike text which expresses stories, uh, code expresses computations, of course, but you still have the same constraints. It has to, like text has to follow a grammar, code has to follow uh, the laws of logic, and it has to work and not crash, um, and it has to not immediately communicate the story or emotions, but it has to produce a demo effect which talks to the emotions of the audience. And so you have sort of the same challenge there. So the job of the coder, the C64 coder, is to take words from the dictionary, in this case uh, instructions, uh, and place them uh, all over the places where, uh, where they have to be to do these uh, Vic tricks. Uh, and all of the rest to do uh, the actual demo effect. And this is quite similar to the, the work of a poet. Now, I show you this again because I want to draw your attention to the red uh, slots here, and those are where cycles get stolen. And we can manipulate, just like we can manipulate uh, where the whether the border is open, we can manipulate where cycles get stolen. Uh, we do this by turning on or off sprites, uh, and we can also actually select which lines are bad lines, or which parts of raster lines are bad lines. And that means that, there's, uh, that C64 coding goes beyond the traditional constraints of poetry in which you select a form, you, you decide to write a sonnet, for instance, or a haiku or whatever, and then that form influences what you can do with the words, so, so it influences the content. On the C64, the form, uh, in the sense of uh, where the cycles get stolen, influence uh, the timing of the instructions and thus the meaning of the instructions. Uh, but but the, using instructions, we can do various big tricks that move around the stolen cycles. So that means that the timing of the instructions, the meaning of the instructions, also affects the poetic form. Uh, and so it's, it's very tightly coupled. <clears throat> now, I've shown some of the formal similarities between C64 coding and poetry. There are also methodological similarities. Uh, suppose you want to write a poem on the topic of life is short, art is long. Um, this, is, this bromide is about 800 years old, so that's not very creative, but you don't have to be creative when you select a topic, right? So you're going to write a poem on this, and you start uh, writing, and you have some really good ideas, and, 
and some lines that work really well, and some rhymes that you like, and then you get stuck to a, a situation where you think really hard, but you can't find a way of, of putting uh, words onto the syllables of the poetic form and, and make it work out in a good way. Then your, your subconscious will constantly give you hints that you should change things. So for instance, you could change, maybe you could change the subject to something which isn't really what you wanted to write about, but something else, like life is short, art makes it longer, or whatever. I mean, and, and you try this and suddenly everything fits into place. Suddenly you solve the puzzle and, and now you ended up being more creative than you set out to be. So the constraints of the poetic form guided you into being more creative than you would otherwise have been. And exactly the same thing happens in C64 coding, uh, that you perhaps you see some effect and you want to copy it or, or, or do, do it a little bit differently. Um, you try to implement it, at some point you get stuck and you start thinking, well, if I change this or that, and I don't do that, and I move some, I add some sprites or whatever, then you end up with an effect that nobody has done before. And so you, you are more creative than you set out to be. And working with the constraints in this way is very stimulating, uh, uh, as well as challenging, of course. Finally, coming back to the title, uh, Poems for Bugs, this communicates the sad uh, sort of notion that uh, people are spending all of these hours meticulously crafting works of art and the only audience is the bugs in the C64, right? But, one of, but it's not the entire truth because one of the remarkable things about the C64 scene is that people actually read your code. Uh, and this is from the tradition that you try to do the impossible. And you try to, like I said, you use various tricks to try to escape from this fixed uh, display mode, and people will be wondering, well, how do they do that? And uh, so if they are coders, whether they are just flabbergasted and want to see how it's done, or they have a theory of how it's done, but they want to verify the theory, they just push the freezer button on the debugging cartridge, go into the monitor, look at the machine code, and see all the cleverness that went into it. And people actually do this. And so a more apt title would be Poems for Bugs and Other C64 Coders. <clears throat> In conclusion then, quirks are fun. We started looking at various reasons for why people would make C64 demos in the year 2013. And uh, I showed you some of the quirks and uh, bugs are exploitable. Over here we looked at how bugs in nature are exploitable as well as then how bugs in the C64 are exploitable. And it all has to do with uh, the way sequences or rituals are encoded in, in animals and in uh, machines uh, in the form of independent rules from which a high level sequence emerges. But if we modify the environment at precisely the right time, then a different sequence can emerge from the same rules. And so that's how we exploit them. And then uh, timing is essential in C64 coding compared to, for instance, PC coding, where you have to, your code has to be fast, but all, all you have to be concerned about is to put the instructions in the correct order so they compute the right thing. On C64, they also have to be executed at, they also have to execute at uh, precisely the right moment. And finally, C64 coding has a lot in common with poetry. Uh, and looked on in that light, C64 coding is just the current embodiment of a tradition that goes back thousands of years and will probably continue for thousands of years to come. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes? Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Um, yeah, I was just interested how you, um, how you've got like graph paper and you plan out what you're doing over the entire frame, because um, I started doing something similar for my Amstrad demo, where again I had to do something every sc uh, every scan line at the right time, and after a couple of iterations of that, I just found it so much work that instead I made a code generator, and I just found that saved me so much time. And I just wondered if uh, people on the C64 are doing that kind of thing. Uh, so what what I'm doing usually is that I. I draw out um, usually eight raster lines, and then the whole thing repeats. 
sort of. Uh, so, so I have, depending on the effect, it could also be one raster line or two or four or something. But just this little chunk that repeats. And then I, I draw that with pencil and I put it in the computer and, and then I use that as a template. So I have code which reads the template, stores it in memory, reads it, changes it a bit, reads it again, stores it, so, so it unrolls the loop, um, puts all the instructions in memory, and then runs through them. So I use code generators, yes. There was a question in the front, or, yeah? I was going to ask what kind of tools that are available for, for this, but you all already said something about that. Uh, how, how long do you think it takes for someone to start to, from zero and master something worth watching? Yeah. Um, so the, the things I showed you is the part of C64 coding that is unique or characteristic for C64 coding. There are also... Uh, some effects that you do that are more similar to PC coding, where you just have to make code that runs fast. And uh, that goes also for the, for, the, for the music player, for instance. Uh, so, so one way is to start with that part and, and just try to uh, work with a, the standard display mode. Uh, the other thing is if you want to do this uh, cycle accurate things, uh, which is the fun part, uh, then you should start with looking up a routine to get a stable raster. And what that means you, your code will start executing at one specific part on the screen. And you can just uh, find that on the web. Eventually, you will understand it. So you, to start, you can just copy paste that. And then, then you can start experimenting. Uh, there are documents. There's a really good document about the Vic chip called the Vic article. Uh, that's a lot of information in there. Uh, but uh, you should read that one at some point. There's also codebase64.org, which is a wiki for various C64 effects uh, that you can use. Uh, there are tutorials. Uh, I can't remember the names of them, but there are several tutorials that you can Google and find. Uh, so, so it's really no, no reason to, to not start uh, coding C64 demos. Um, just as a fun part, um, I'm coding on the Atari 2600 VCS, and I've done exactly the same thing with the with the with your sheets, um, only digital, mm -hmm. so that I've got something like fridge magnets that I can move around. So this is what I'm going to show you after the talk. Okay, cool. Uh, the, the, uh, and that has, of course, benefits over pen and paper, but pen and paper also has the benefits that you can, you can print a few of these and bring them with you at all times. So you can, long train trips, for instance, you can sit there and work out your effects. So uh, both methods have their, uh, their pros and cons. And others do crossword puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, others make crossword puzzles, which is more like this. Yeah. More questions? This one. Sorry, me again. Um, so I don't know much about the C64, but I was, re I was watching some or reading something about using some timer chips, uh, the timer chip to generate an interrupt per scan line. Is that accurate enough to do this trick as well? Uh, the problem with uh, getting a stable, uh, stable raster is that uh, you would typically want to use an interrupt, but the interrupt will wait until the current instruction is finished. And uh, in contrast with modern computers where the instructions execute in one cycle because they're pipelined, on C64, as you saw, there are uh, at least two cycles in every instruction, and some of them have up to eight cycles. And so that means you get a jitter in the interrupt response, uh, and you have to get, get rid of this jitter. And there are, are at least three, maybe four fundamentally different ways of doing that. Uh, the simplest is to, to first, on the first interrupt, you have this jitter of seven cycles. Then you just uh, um, schedule an, in an interrupt on the next line, just executing NOPs until that interrupt happens. Now you're down to one cycle jitter. And then you get rid of that by waiting for the end of the raster line and reading the raster line register to figure out if you're already past the edge to the next one. And then branch uh, differently be depending on that to get rid of the final cycle. So that's the easiest way. The most complex way is uh, known as uh, the ninja method, the distributed jitter correction. Uh, and that is very clever, but I don't think this is the audience that will uh, 
appreciate if I <laughs> describe it. But it's really clever. More questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming here.